Hello everybody, thanks for joining us for another story time today. Today is a super special day. Does anybody know what today is? That's right, it's Earth Day! We have been celebrating Earth Day now. This is the 50th year we are celebrating Earth Day, which is really exciting. Um, so today's story time is going to be a little bit about the history of Earth Day. But Earth Day is all about learning about the plants and the animals that we have in this world and what we can do to help them um, and how to treat them respectfully. So our story today is going to be about that. It's also about a very special scientist. Um, she was a woman scientist and she became a scientist about 90 years ago, which way back then, there wasn't very many women scientists. So she's what we call a pioneer, or somebody kind of leading the way in her field. Um, and this story is all about what she did to help the earth and how she started something called the environmental movement which is when people really started caring about the actions that we were taking and the impact that they had on the planet. So we're going to learn about that today in our story here called Spring After Spring, how Rachel Carson inspired the environmental movement. It's written by Stephanie Roth Sisson. In nature, nothing exists alone. To my nature-loving mom, Mary Louise Roth, with love, it's from the author. And this is Springdale, Pennsylvania, where Rachel Carson was from. I'm going to warn you right now that this book has a lot of noises in it, so I'm going to do my best with all the sound. Cheerily, it was dawn when the chorus began. Cheerily, cheer up, jur it, jeru, phoebe. Jerry, Jerry, witchety, witchety, tea or tea, meow, meow, toey, Phoebe, cheer, toey, coo, coo, coo. Do you recognize any of those bird sounds? Maybe you hear them in the morning too, just like Rachel did when she was in bed. Rachel didn't want to miss a note, so she runs outside and she hears pew, pew. Coo, coo, chur, cheerily, hoo, hoo, tea kettle, tea kettle, cheer, cheer, buzz, and Rachel says, hello. As the midday sun warmed the earth, other musicians chimed in. Life and music were all around. Chipmunk says, chip, hummingbird says, cheat it. Grasshopper says, chirp, chirp. Ladybug, buzz. Cardinal, wait, wait, wait. Spring peeper, peep, peep, peep. And their honeybee says, buzz. And wonders big and small. So she's looking up at the sky and through her hand lens to see all the small things too. Spring was Rachel's favorite time of year. Jerit, Jeru, Jerry, Jerley, Witchity, Witchity, Jerley, Jerley. As the sun set, she could hear the first bubbles of frog song. Crickets began their nighttime tune, and bats squeaked a lullaby. Chirp, 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 squeak. At home, there was warm supper and a big family. Mom played the piano, and Dad sang songs and read stories. Roaring seaward, and I go. Rocked in the cradle of the deep. It's a bird sleeping. Rachel's favorite songs and stories, stories were those about the sea. Purr, purr, says her cat who's sleeping with her. And she's dreaming about the ocean. As the days grew longer and warmer, the chattering, chirping, and hooting got louder. Cheep, cheep. Cheep, Hoot, hoot. Chirp, chirp. Runt. She's got some frog eggs and tadpoles in there, fox kits, baby owls, baby chipmunks, baby robins, and a deer fawn too. Until the gathering calls from migrating birds meant that it was autumn. They were coming together for their long journey through the ocean of air to their winter homes. We all know what sound the geese make when they fly overhead. Honk, honk, honk. But not everyone left. Phoebe, Phoebe, cheer, cheer, cheer. 
snuggled under a warm blanket, Rachel drew pictures and wrote about the life she experienced all year. She read books about animals and imagined what their lives were like. Spring after spring, year after year, the birds arrived. Every season, Rachel watched, listened, and wrote. And like the nestlings, she grew quickly. Then one autumn, it was time for her to go off to college. She was sure she wanted to be a writer until... She looked through a microscope and saw a small world in a drop of water. Tiny sea plants and animals. Rachel was amazed and in love. She wanted to know more about the very small world made visible by a microscope. She had never been to the ocean and was scared to go in the water. To learn about the creatures in the tidal pools, marshes, and the sea, Rachel decided that she would study biology. She put her writing aside. So biology is the study of living things. After she finished school, Rachel worked as a scientist and compiled information about the ocean. Now for her job, she wanted to know what it was like to actually be underwater. She was still scared, but she went anyway. In the fish world, many things are told by the sound of the waves. Rachel began to write books about the sea. They were so full of scientific detail and vivid descriptions of the lives of the sea creatures that people could imagine those worlds. Have you ever read a book with so much detail you could perfectly picture it in your head? Rachel became a famous author. People are reading her books called Under the Sea Wind, The Sea Around Us, and The Edge of the Sea. So her books were about the sea. But there was something wrong. Uh oh. All around, nature's voices were going quiet. So she doesn't hear the birds singing anymore or the insects buzzing. So Rachel did what she did best. She watched closely, she listened carefully, and learned as much as she could about what was happening. Rachel put together scattered facts and found the answer. People wanted to kill bugs that ate their plants, bothered them, and sometimes even made them sick. Chemists created new poisons to solve the insect problems that seemed to work and seemed to be harmless to creatures and humans. These poisonous chemicals were quickly used everywhere in huge amounts because people thought that they were safe. But Rachel found evidence that the poisons were not safe. So here's three different ways that the poisons were hurting the animals. It says poison was eaten by microscopic water life. So those tiny things we need a microscope to see. That water life was eaten by tiny fish. Tiny fish were eaten by bigger fish. And bigger fish were eaten by eagles. Eagle shells are so thin that they're breaking during incubation or when the parent eagles sit on the egg. So they found that the chemicals we were putting on our plants to get rid of bugs were actually affecting our eagles too. They almost went extinct way back then. Another way, it says poison coats worms in the ground. Those worms are eaten by birds. Birds eat many worms that are coated in poison and then that bird can actually die. Or another way, poison coats the worms and the insects in the ground. Worms and insects are eaten by a bird, and then something else, like a fox, might eat that bird. The fox eats birds and mice and other animals that have eaten the poison, and then it makes the fox sick, or the fox might die. So she found out that these poisons were not good for other animals either. Rachel wrote a book to tell people what she had learned. Her book was called Silent Spring. Silent Spring created a huge ruckus. Some people were inspired to change, but many people didn't believe Rachel. Why are we putting them everywhere? Are they the only answer? Do we have to use so much of these chemicals? Are you sure that they're safe? 
But some of the other people were saying, they are perfectly safe. Trust us. They're the answer to our pest problems. They are modern chemicals for a modern world. Eventually, President Kennedy took notice and began an investigation to find out what was true. Rachel was asked to come to Washington, D.C. to defend her book. She was scared, but she went. Rachel's testimony in Washington and her writing in Silent Spring made people see that they have an effect on the environment and other creatures that they share the world with. People were inspired to speak up, Congress passed new laws so that nature was treated with more care, and some of the most harmful chemicals were banned. Spring after spring, year after year, people celebrated the earth and the environment because Rachel showed them how beautiful and how precious it is. Look at all the people out enjoying nature now. And the birds are still singing. Dee, 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 jerry, jerry, jerry. And the people are now saying hello. But Rachel went home and continued watching and listening. In the morning, she went out among the tide pools and gathered specimens. In the afternoon, she carefully studied them and took notes on her observations. And in the evening, when the tide had gone out again, she returned each creature with great care, exactly in the spot she had found it, exactly where it belonged. That's the end of the story, but the author wrote another note at the end about Rachel, so we'll read that. It says, I have long loved Rachel Carson's writing, especially her books about the wonders of nature where she writes so poetically about science. But her most famous book, Silent Spring, is hard for me to read because it's a warning about what happens when people are not careful. Silent Spring is one of those rare books that changes the way a whole society thinks. In the 1950s, people thought that science could solve all their problems and that nature could be controlled through chemicals. No one questioned that, except Rachel Carson. In a 1963 television interview, Rachel said, the balance of nature is built on a series of relationships between living things and their environment. Rachel knew chemicals had their place, but she asked people to slow down and look carefully at what they were doing to understand that by affecting the tiniest creatures, they were influencing the whole web of life, including humans. In the end, I realized that Silent Spring is about ecology and the wonders of nature, just like all of our other books, and I came to love it as well. Rachel died on April 14, 1964, just two years after writing Silent Spring. She was 57 years old. She never saw the full impact of her work. Silent Spring led to the formation of the Environmental Protection, Protection Agency, and it inspired people to try to find less harmful ways to deal with pests. It's widely seen as the beginning of the environmental movement, which led to the creation of Earth Day. Rachel Carson gave a voice to nature and large quantities all over the world. Oops, I'm sorry. Rachel Carson gave a voice to nature and an awareness of people's connection to our fragile planet. However, pesticides and herbicides are still used in large quantities all over the world, and they still negatively affect many animal species as well as humans. There's still so much to learn about the relationship between living things and their environment, and this knowledge is crucial to understanding climate change. Today's right, or today, Rachel's writing is as important as ever. That's the end of our stories. It says, as human beings, we are part of the whole stream of life. So in our story, Rachel did a really, really great job of observing things in nature. She watched with her eyes, she listened with her ears, and she did everything she could to learn about what she was seeing. And a lot of the best scientists that we've had that have studied nature and helped the planet have done those same things. So for this Earth Day, if you want to be a scientist that helps the planet, the best thing you can do is start by making a lot of observations and just learning about what's around you. Because if we don't know what's around us and how those plants and animals normally act in nature, then we're not going to know when things that we're doing, the actions we're taking, are affecting those plants or animals. We need to know when they change because of what we're doing. So the best thing you can do is get out and observe, take notes. You could make drawings like Rachel did. You could keep a nature journal. 
And one of the most fun ways, I think, to observe things in nature is to do something called citizen science. So that's when normal people like me or you um, go out and observe and we collect our data. So you could write down what you see. And then we turn it in online. We put it in this big database where everybody's submitting what they're seeing or what they're hearing. And the scientists from all over the world can use that. Right now, a lot of scientists are trying to figure out what's happening to a lot of our animals as our climate is changing. Some places are getting warmer, some places are getting colder, some places might be getting drier, they're not getting very much rain, and others are having more floods. So things are changing in the world and scientists are trying to figure out how those changes are affecting some of our wildlife or our plants. So your observations about what's happening in your area can be really helpful because our scientists can't be everywhere all at once. So they're asking for our help. I'll post some resources down below of programs that you could be a part of. One of my favorite ones in the spring and summer is something called Nest Watch. So if you have a nest in your yard that you like to watch, maybe you watch the eggs hatch or baby robins or something like that, you can actually just record those like every four days, I think it asks you to make an observation and submit it. And that is really, really helpful to scientists all over the world. Another thing you can do um, is it is Earth Day. So another resource I'll post is a pledge that you can make for Earth Day. So think of something with your family that you could do to help the Earth. And there are so many options you could do. You could go out today um, for a walk and pick up litter. You could at home make sure you're shutting off water when you're not using it and shutting off your lights. You could plant a garden since we have we might have a little more time at home than we usually do. Um, you could start a compost pile. You could do a lot of different things for the planet and I'll post some ideas down below. But I bet you could come up with some really cool ones all on your own. The other thing I'm gonna post down below are some observation games that you can play with your family. So we know that Rachel, as a scientist, was really good at making observations and noticing things. And I have some fun games that you can play that will help you practice those skills at home. Let's see. The other last thing that I would like to do before I post those resources down below um, is I have a special message for our parents today. So our kids got our story time already. Books upside down. Um, and I have part of a Rachel Carson book that I would like to read to our parents. I think this message is really, really important right now. I know a lot of our parents are feeling like they got thrust into this at-home teacher position that maybe they weren't feeling ready for. Um, and I think this part of Rachel Carson's book, or it was an essay, I guess, called The Sense of Wonder, I think this can really help drive home an important point for us right now about being a teacher or a role model for our kids at home. So, kids, thanks for listening. I, you can stay on if you want, but this message is for our adults. Okay, so again, this is from Rachel Carson's book, The Sense of Wonder. A child's world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that for most of us, that clear-eyed vision and true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed, and even most before we reach adulthood. If I had influence with the good fairy who is supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life, as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantments of later years. The sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, the alienation from the sources of our strength. If a child is to keep alive his inborn sense of wonder without any such gift from the fairies, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him the joy, the joy and excitement and mystery of the world we live in. Parents often have a sense of inadequacy when confronted, on one hand, with the eager, sensitive mind of a child, and on the other, with a world of complex physical nature, inhabited by a life so various and unfamiliar that it seems hopeless to reduce it to order and knowledge. In the mood of self-defeat, they explain, how can I possibly teach my child about nature? Why, I don't even know one bird from another. I sincerely believe that for the child and for the parents seeking to guide him, it is not half so important to know as it is to feel. If facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then emotions and impressions of the senses are the fertile soil in which the seeds must grow. 
The years of early childhood are the time to prepare the soil. Once the emotions have been aroused, a sense of the beautiful, the excitement of the new and the unknown, a feeling of sympathy, pity, admiration, or love, then we wish for knowledge about the object of our emotional response. Once found, it has a lasting meaning. It is more important to pave the way for a child to want to know than to put him on a diet of facts he is not ready to assimilate. So please, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter if you know about nature or not, be getting your kids outside every day, instill in them that sense of wonder about nature, and the rest will come naturally.